So welcome everyone to uh, Contesting the City, Migration Spaces and Places, which is a seminar series organized by the Motiri Satyanarayana Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences and Politics at CREA. Um, just before we start off with our inaugural uh, lecture, uh, I'd like to ask Professor Vishnu Mahapatra, who's director of the Motiri Center and professor of politics to introduce the series. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the inaugural lecture for this academic year. Uh, Motiri Satyanarayana Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Science began its journey in 2022. And uh, with a very generous endowment by the family members of Motiri Satyanarayana. And Sri Motiri Satyanarayana was, uh, among many other things, uh, was a member of the Indian Constituent Assembly and a Gandhian and who kind of advocated for a great deal of interaction and integration in the country. And I'm delighted to welcome Radhika to the first talk that we have for this academic year. Uh, in the past, we organized talks uh, revolving around the issues of language, uh, diminishment of language, language politics, and, and issues like that. And uh, at, at the center, we have a kind of uh, important postdoctoral research program where we uh, invite uh, postdoctoral uh, scholars uh, following the process and they remain uh, for two years and uh, the large objective of, of, of this program is to actually enable the postdoctoral scholars to do their writing and maybe do a bit of research that they is necessary to do but largely to complete the writing and produce their research in terms of publications both book and and, and journal articles and so on. So I'm delighted uh, that uh, we are doing it in collaboration with uh, uh, faculty of politics at CREA. So I welcome everyone, uh, those who are uh, outside uh, CREA University, to welcome uh, to CREA University, to, to welcome to the center. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy that we are uh, starting it. We also have uh, another three more talks after this. And uh, I hope you'll join us uh, in the future as well. Uh, I thank uh, all my postdoctoral fellows at the center, and particularly Jen, who has taken the responsibility for organizing this series. So Jen, I think over to you, and Radhika, welcome once again. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Radhika Machani Chakrabarti. Um, Dr. Chakrabarti has a PhD in sociology from the National University of Singapore. Her research explores diaspora, migration, and gender in Asian contexts. Her doctoral research focuses on the Hindu Sindhi diaspora in Hong Kong and has been awarded the NUS Ananda Raja Prize. Radhika has a master's degree in women's studies from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai and has previously worked with social legal services for women survivors of violence. Her research and writings have appeared in the Journal of Refugee Studies, the Journal of Sindhi Studies, Economic and Political Weekly, and the Journal of Gender-Based Violence, amongst others. She will be a visiting professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Ashoka University for the 2023 monsoon semester. So Radhika will be speaking to us today about diaspora and nodal mobilities, the Hindu Sindhi community in Hong Kong. So over to you, Radhika. Thank you so much, Sen. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, I'm so excited to present some of my doctoral work today. Uh, I'll just begin by sharing my screen and please let me know if you can uh, see and hear. Uh, is, it, is it all right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Uh, so many, many thanks to the Muthuri, Muthuri Satyanarayan Center at Kriya for having me here today as a part of this seminar series. 
Um, and I hope that uh, my work has some resonances with the other seminars in this series and speaks to um, how cities as places are imagined and constructed by uh, diasporic communities and groups. So my talk today will focus on the Hindus in the diaspora and their histories of settlement and belonging in Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong was one of the important nodes in an erstwhile Sindhi merchant network, and the contours of the Hindu Sindhi diaspora have most often been mapped through these colonial and pre-colonial merchant networks, which extended from Sindh to across the globe. Um, and an array of dispersals, migrations, settlings um, have emerged through these networks and trade routes across a range of diasporic locales, or what I'll be calling nodes. So my talk today is informed by these merchant histories, but it also explores the social worlds of the contemporary Sindhi diaspora with a focus on a particular diasporic note, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so through ethnographic research and archival resources and interviews with Hindu Sindhis in Hong Kong, I'll uh, trace the emergence of Hong Kong as a diasporic node through past as well as future mobilities and imaginaries. And I suggest that the diaspora node evokes and extends the histories of the merchant networks and their trading nodes to frame how flows of people, ideas and things uh, coalesce and shape contemporary diasporic formations. So rather than beginning with questions of culture, displacement, and homeland, and nostalgia, which are often the starting points of thinking with diaspora, I'll uh, work with a more historically grounded framing and uh, suggest that an analysis of nodal mobilities uh, presents diaspora as a lens for exploring how people move and are moved and where they situate themselves and the connections engendered through these movements and mobilities. Uh, so I'll begin by very briefly mapping the histories of the Sindhi merchant diaspora in broad strokes. And then I'll organize this talk through an engagement with an interrogation of some of the key conceptual axes that have characterized diaspora scholarship. So first, uh, classical approaches to diaspora studies have often foregrounded the homeland and an experience of rupture, displacement, and a protracted journey away from the homeland. And uh, however, they uh, sometimes map homeland to origin and to ethnicity and identity. So to address this, I'll critically read some of the origins and antecedents of the Sindhi diaspora. And as some contemporary diaspora scholars have suggested, I'll move towards thinking with multiple points of departure and a more expansive and historical approach to movement and place. Uh, next, diaspora studies has often been critiqued for its approach to ethnicity. So while contemporary sociological and anthropological scholarship on ethnicity has largely adopted a reflexive and constructionist approach, which views ethnic identification as contingent and identities, ethnic, national, and regional as multifaceted um, and often simultaneously local and global, um, some diaspora scholarship often takes as its starting point more singular framings of uh, ethnicity and categorization um, as the starting points for thinking about community cohesion, even as it acknowledges uh, diversity in homes and homing practices and hybridization and hybrid cultures. So in this section on Sindhi belonging in Hong Kong, I'll discuss how an attention to diaspora nodes and forms of belonging and unbelonging in Hong Kong um, reframe some of the conversation around diaspora and ethnicity. And third is the lens of uh, nostalgia and the past, or what has been called by some as the backward glance of diaspora. And uh, it's focused on a shared past experience of displacement. And instead, I'll uh, discuss how Hong Kong came to be constructed and imagined as a place of the future for the Sindhi diaspora. And I'll make a case for a more expansive temporal approach and a greater attention to future temporalities of diaspora. Um, and I'll end with an invitation to sort of discuss what I'm provisionally uh, proposing as the nodal mobilities of diaspora, which foregrounds the Hindu Sindhi community's movements and connections through the diasporic node of Hong Kong. Uh, so the region of Sindh is, of course, located in the southeastern part of contemporary Pakistan, and Sindh was administered by the Talpur Mirs from um, 1783 until colonial annexation by the British in 1843. So the regional history of Sindh has most commonly been presented as marginal to the rest of the Indian subcontinent. 
peripheral to larger empire formations, but poised advantageously for trade. Um, when it was annexed by the British, since population comprised of a Muslim majority, but a range of uh, Hindu or non-Muslim groups wielded political and commercial power. And amongst these were um, the Amil and the Bhai Bankas, who had an important place in commerce and administration. Uh, so historians and other scholars of Sindh have explored how Hindu Sindhi emerged as a category or group identification through a regional history of colonial categorization. And I'll begin here to highlight how diasporic homelands themselves should be read as contested spaces through a critical view of origins and an attention to multiple points of departure. So um, scholars have examined how the question of origins has shaped what uh, Paroma Roy has called the subject constituting projects of colonialism. So colonial ethnographies often became exercises in mapping categories, um, often coded as race and caste, which framed and prescribed modes of belonging and outsiderness. And sin was no exception to this. Historians Uttara Shahani and Shayan Rajani have argued that sin became a case par excellence of colonial framings of difference. Uh, one important figure in this process was Richard Burton, who was the paradigmatic colonial ethnographer of Sindh. And Uttra Shahani has convincingly highlighted how Burton deployed the racialized categorizations of Hindu and Muslim and marked Hindus as other through biological logics like descriptions and explorations of their physical attributes and speculated about the histories of their migration, most often describing them as foreign with their origins always elsewhere. The resonances of these kinds of colonial framings of difference can also be traced through important historiographic junctures in the regional history of Sindh. So as Manan Ahmad Asif has noted, such colonial debates uh, on the codification of script for the Sindhi language, for instance, as well as the discovery of Indus Valley civilization remains speak to these kinds of um, categorizations and discourses of otherness and belonging. So uh, in terms of the Indus Valley civilization remains, um, uh, this conversation cleaved along ethnic or communal fissures because some use this to claim a Hindu nativity in Sindh, while others made a case for the exceptional regional character of Sindh as having a history that predated neighboring geographies. So at historical junctures like this and through these kinds of debates, um, we see that the question of Hindu Sindhi's origins seemed already to be contested, and the ethnic identity was fragmented across colonial, racial, and regional ethnology and history writing. Uh, the partition and displacement of Hindu Sindhis is another historical juncture which troubles continuities between um, religion, ethnicity, and regional belonging as Sindhi nationalists and politicians deployed discourses of ethnicity which mapped onto a regional rather than religious identification to mark the difference of Muslim migrants from other parts of India. Whereas in India, loci of belonging crystallized around linguistic categories as well as the categories of Hindu and Muslim. So all this is to say that it's important while thinking about diaspora to keep in mind that as Shayan Rajani writes, Sindh was neither consistently imagined as a racial unit nor a linguistic entity or even a cultural entity. Instead, these notions were brought together in different arrangements at different historical moments in a messy and recursive process. And the category or group of Sindhi Hindu emerged at these crisscrossings of these rifts and processes. So alongside uh, these developments in the region of Sindh, two major networks of Hindu traders from the Bhaiban's trading caste emerged from Sindh, the Shikarpuri network and the Sindhwaki network. Um, the historian Claude Markowitz has documented the global spread of these networks in, in detail, and I draw primarily on his work to very briefly contextualize these networks. So Shikarpuri merchants from the town of Shikarpur began to follow inland trade routes to Central Asia, which led to a well-established merchant network by the mid-18th century. The Sindhwaki network from Hyderabad grew later from 1860 onwards. Um, so after colonial annexation and the move of the capital from Hyderabad to Karachi, Hindu bankers and merchants in Hyderabad were able to take advantage of colonial connections between Sindh and Bombay. And then rather than competing for business in the new capital, Karachi, they harnessed global circuits of imperial capital and trade and uh, traveled to sell local crafts, which were uh, commonly called Sindh work, to a European clientele. 
uh, the bulk of their enterprise soon shifted to import export goods of goods from their dispersed networks, even though they continue to be called Sindhwad keys. So these firms therefore evolved highly specialized and diversified avenues of business, trading in a range of items based on uh, where they were based in the network, ranging from silk from China, lace from Malta, later fabric from Japan, and also in uh, curios and tourist items, and later the import and export of sundries. Uh, so Markowitz highlights that in the early phases of this network, there were about six major Sindhi firms, but in subsequent generations, there was a much greater diversity and uh, proliferation, sorry, Sindhwaki firms. There was a greater proliferation of these uh, Sindhwaki networks across the world. And uh, this is a map from his work, which uh, sort of locates where some of the Sindhwakis were based. Uh, he estimates that uh, by 1937, there were over 5,000 Sindhwakis living and trading across the world and suggests that uh, this network was perhaps one of the most extensive international merchant networks by the time of partition. So while the Shikarpuri network relied on the financial instrument of the Hundi, which was a promissory note or indigenous bill of exchange to make capital mobile, in the Sindhwaki network, uh, they employed a more European system of centralization of the firms, which included salaried managers, branches, and a tiered organizational structure, which was spread across offices across the globe, uh, most often with headquarters to report to in Hyderabad. So this organizational structure created degrees of localization and mobility for the merchant network. Uh, these merchant mobilities frame the context or the emergence of certain migratory groups of the uh, Sindhi diaspora. And Adam McEwen, the historian, um, has uh, described how Chinese diasporas experience these kinds of migratory groups, which are carved through histories of movement and concrete institutions, and across which some, perhaps the elite, could move more freely, but some, for some migrants, became more inflexible pathways. So although the histories of Sindhwaki business were built largely along migratory groups carved by imperial expansion and trade, the stories of Sindhi businesses and migrations were told to me in Hong Kong through light narratives and individual family histories. And these accounts show how uh, merchant networks shaped and were shaped by familial histories, branchings, and interconnected mobilities, and how they often exceeded these wider groups of imperial trade and took on a localized character. Uh, so T.K. Nichanani or Sindhwaki himself, who wrote a treatise in the 1920s on the, some of the ills of Sindhwaki business practices, uh, noted that during the expansion of this trading network, Sindhwaki families would encourage their friends to send their sons to work from them to earn money and to become smart. And uh, many of my interlocutors in Hong Kong calculated that their fathers would have been perhaps between 16 to 20 years of age when they first set out from Sindh to work. Um, the male literacy rate was uh, rising in Hyderabad by the 1920s, and an increasing number of high-burned youth had a knowledge of English, which uh, helped them aspire to and seek work abroad. Um, early Sindhwaki circulated between Sindh and Bari trading outposts on limited contracts or musafdis, usually of two or three years, and their pathways were also shaped and transformed by historical contingencies and moments of disruption, such as wartime or broader economic shifts. And there were many ups and downs in their migratory biographies. Um, and kinship and familial networks were essential to how they negotiated these ups and downs. So um, the biographies that I collected of families who had been in sin work for two or more generations would often recount how their fathers or grandfathers would travel um, between locales ranging from Spain, Tangiers, Taiwan, Japan, Panama, Gibraltar, Hong Kong, and also moving between two or three firms be before perhaps beginning their own or retiring as employees. Um, I also found that familial obligations and connections were uh, often negotiated through wives and women's family networks, which facilitated the migration and mobilities of empl and employment of men. So although the Sindhwaki Merchant Network predated partition, partition did change the nature and expanse of the merchant network as employees were drawn from a widening network of kin and social relations. And in the cases of places like Hong Kong, sometimes they were drawn from a pool of Sindhi men who had managed to secure a ticket to visit a relative or an acquaintance and use this to seek work at Sindhi companies there. 
but accounts of migration and branching of um, Sindhi businesses and men's migration for employment with relatives were often very frictive and sometimes painful. And this was true of larger as well as smaller firms. Many of the people who I interviewed uh, regarding their family-owned businesses described some form of a break or a branching in their... I was talking about the sort of frictive and familial branchings uh, of uh, Sindhwaki firms. Many, uh, if not all of the interlocutors who I spoke to about family-owned businesses would describe some form of break or branching in their trajectory. So either they themselves moved away from exploitative relatives or uncles to start their own business, or they had their own relatives and employees set up competing businesses. So the histories of these Sindhi firms are as much a story of rupture and branching as of familial and co-ethnic corporacy and continuity. And in some of the narratives I collected, families also provided financial support to kickstart new businesses. Um, and therefore, even as familial networks facilitated migratory opportunities, uh, relationships within families, perceived slights, disagreements about money, or other discordant encounters and relationships created forms of branching in the histories of Sindhi business and migratory biographies. So these branchings of families, of businesses, of uh, mobilities, speak to the nodal nature of the shape and spread of diaspora. Uh, Sindhi women in the early years of the merchant network would usually remain in Sin, sometimes while uh, all the men of the family would leave to seek employment abroad. And literature on merchant networks has often highlighted the mobilities and connections of men uh, as the primary drivers of the merchant network with women placed outside of the network proper or even as things uh, as wives that circulate in the network with along with goods and ideas. So particular kinds of mobility and spatiality are very often privileged, both socially and analytically. And it's important to discuss how women's immobilities and mobilities are, are as much a part of the merchant network rather than locating them discrete from or outside of it. So oral history is collected by uh, Saz Agarwal suggests that wealth, the wealth that came in from men traveling for sin work was often spent and managed by women in sin. And some oral narratives also suggest uh, restrictions on women's mobility outside the home. Uh, and in some Bhairban household, rigid social hierarchies. Um, but although uh, Hindu Sindhi women's everyday lives in Sindh uh, most often emerge at the peripheries of historical accounts of the merchant diaspora, one historical thread where women became very visible was uh, the contestations around the Brahma Kumari group, which was then known as Om Mandli, and it was founded in Sindh in the 1930s by Lekraj Kiplani, who was formerly a Sindhi jeweler. And several of my interlocutors in Hong Kong narrated how their mothers or grandmothers had been a part of the early membership of Om Mandli. Um, in the early years, most of their membership was drawn from the left behind wives and daughters of Sindhwaki traders in Hyderabad. And a core doctrine uh, was the notion of purity and complete celibacy of its nearly exclusively women members, at least in early years. Uh, Prem Chaudhary has uh, suggested that in the early years, this group positioned itself as a family outside the family, a spiritual, non-sexual safe haven for female followers against the normative, sexually reproductive family. And the context of the emergence of this group speaks to uh, some of the immobilities experienced by women who are expected to reproduce heteronormative families in the absence uh, of their mobile husbands as well. Um, so the presence of the this group soon became very contentious and the wealthy and powerful Thaiwan community in Hyderabad mounted a strong response to Om Mandli, which was couched in the language of propriety, family values, and restoring women to their rightful husbands. Even though some of the testimonials they had gathered from women who had left Om Mandli narrate quite troubling instances of forcible physical and sexual contact. So after protracted resistance and uh, legal intervention, this group was forced to leave Hyderabad. But uh, in this account, we see how rooted Sindhwaki merchants were in the local social economies of uh, Sindh and their investment in patriarchal restrictions on Thaiwan women. Uh, the emergence and development of Omandli offers a window into how women participated in and were constrained by some of the social and sexual economies in Sindh, which were engendered by the migration of their husbands. 
um, partition also became a turning point for the mobilities of Sindhi women. Um, along with uh, uprooting Sindhwaki firms from their base in Hyderabad, many more women over the course of the 40s and 50s began migrating with their husbands and settling in diaspora nodes rather than uh, remaining in Sindh. So these gendered narratives of mobility and immobility reveal how the merchant, merchant diaspora was um, not only sustained and shaped by women's relative immobility in Sindh, but also by their varied movements and migrations at different uh, historical points. So the, the question of origins and roots has been a, a contested and divisive aspect of diaspora and migration scholarship. And these accounts of colonial constructions of uh, Hindu Sindhis and the sort of layered narratives of Sindhi identity that emerge at different historical moments uh, troubles the continuities between Sindh at its ethnicity and territorial origin. So when we unpack the emergence of Sindhi Hindus as a category and as a diasporic group, we are met with a shifting nexus of territorialized and deterritorialized claims. Uh, merchant migratory pathways and familial ruptures and branchings illustrate how diaspora nodes are formed within um, the wider diaspora and merchant networks. And diaspora actors are often led to sites or nodes through circumstantial, familial, and diaspora uh, highlighting a common or singular point of origin enables us to better understand these differentiations. And uh, looking at multiple points of departure across various historical moments and junctures serves as a starting point for thinking with diaspora and striking at a different register than a more singular framing, framing of displacement and ethnic origin. So there's of course a long and well-documented history of trade and mobility between the Indian subcontinent and China predating the colonial period. But following the colonial takeover of Hong Kong, more traders, professionals, and intellectuals began migrating from India to Hong Kong and Shanghai. And uh, treaty ports and cities like Hong Kong became what um, Tim Harper and Sunny Lamdrit called sites of Asian interaction, where multiple migratory troops and flows coalesced and shaped these as urban nodes and maritime networks. By uh, 1935, Hong Kong was one of the largest ports in the world. Um, there was a move towards industrialization in the 60s, then a move away from industry and manufacturing post 80s. And these um, industrial and commercial contours contextualize the Sindhi community's presence and business profile in Hong Kong. So during the 20s and 30s, Sindhi traders were responsible for promoting um, Hong Kong and Chinese goods in uh, West Africa and the Middle East. Um, and as Markowitz suggests, a division of labor emerged, uh, in a sense, between Sindhi and Chinese networks, as Sindhis flourished in urban niches where Chinese traders were not as active, and also leveraged their ability to uh, liaise with uh, European, English, and American clientele. Uh, the export of Chinese goods to other parts of the world continued uh, into the later 1900s as well. Uh, so many employees of the major Sindhi firms in East Asia came to work on renewable uh, two to four year contracts. And in the early 30s, the Sindhi community consisted primarily of male employees and employers. Uh, only 15% of the total overseas Indian population of Hong Kong, many of whom were Sindhi traders, uh, comprised of women. Um, early Sindhi businesses in Hong Kong were branches of the major import export firms. Uh, but also there were these smaller silk stores which dealt in fabric and garments. And many of these silk stores names sort of directly evoked these celebratory imaginaries of empire, such as those that are on the screen from the 37 business directory, um, like Queen Silk Store, King Silk Store, Britannia Silk Store, Empire Silk Store, and a few others evoked specific places in a wider colonial capital imaginary, like uh, Hong Kong Silk Store, Mecca Silk Store, Bombay Silk Store, uh, Taj Mahal Silk Store, Paris Silk Store. So the nomenclature of these stores invokes both a colonial clientele as well as a kind of history of movement and travel. Um, the 50s were an important decade for Sindhi businesses in Hong Kong and uh, manufacturing in Hong Kong grew after the Korean War and uh, increasing migration after partition expanded manufacturing with a boom in electronics and watches and the mushrooming of tailoring shops. Uh, which catered to visiting soldiers in Hong Kong, made Hong Kong an important hub for Sindhi business. And uh, Hong Kong also emerged as a global financial center, and Sindhi businesses here took on the role of indenting or functioning as confirming houses, who essentially provided credit to uh, Sindhi businesses in other parts of the world. 
So for these businesses, Hong Kong became a very important commercial node from which they branched out and reached out across the world to build commercial ties. Um, and credit and employee mobility remained uh, key aspects of emerging forms of Simgi business. So mail order and import export emerged as two very Hong Kong specific mode, not Hong Kong specific, but two of the major forms of business that most of my interlocutors spoke about. So custom tailoring and then later the mail order emerged and thrived in context of the Korean and Vietnam wars. Uh, Sindhi served as middlemen between clients and largely Chinese tailors. So they would take measurements and orders from troops who had traveled to Hong Kong for their r, &R. And uh, these garments had a very quick turnover due to the short time that the soldiers were in Hong Kong, which gave rise to what was known as the 24-hour suit. And in later years, Sindhis began to use the contacts they had made among soldiers, and they flew to uh, countries across the world, including USA, Japan, uh, parts of Africa, um, to collect orders from uh, former clients as well as solicit new clients. And suits were, suits were stitched in Hong Kong and then shipped to the growing network of clients. And this line of tailoring was colloquially called mail order. So Hong Kong became as the New York Times in 1971 put it, the leading uh, haberdasher of the Far East. And the Hong Kong Tourism Board also promoted um, tailoring and Hong Kong suits as a kind of cultural export. Uh, discourse around Hong Kong tailoring often emphasized luxury along with affordability. And as this advertisement on the screen does, it compares the differing speed of a globalizing market uh, which produces what it calls off the peg standardization to Hong Kong tailoring, which promises both a kind of speed and efficiency and cut prices, but also a personalized luxury and customization. And the 24 hour suit, which was initially uh, popularized to cater to soldiers on leaves, but later became a novelty item, seemed to represent these kind of accelerated temporalities that the city and its products offered, which um, Sindhi mail order businesses capitalized on. Um, the mail order business became a very lucrative field for young Sindhi men from India who were in search of work. And uh, as one of the older uh, interlocutors told me, in those days, it was very famous, two plus two. That means you get 200 USD salary and 2% commission, and you also get to travel and see the USA. Although they rarely traveled for work, women also played an important role in some mail order businesses. As many worked in partnership with their husbands in the early years of setting up new firms, uh, running storefronts and collecting orders uh, that they would uh, fax to them or that uh, came in while they traveled. So uh, import-export was another major avenue of business and the city uh, became uh, not only a node for exporting goods from China, but also a densely populated locale with considerable tourism and a growing market for these small goods and sundries. Um, so in the ad advertisements on the screen, which are from the 50s and 60s, uh, we see this motley collection of items which are sold by Sindhi firms in Hong Kong. And these are what would be referred to as sanjis, which is a changing assortment of everyday objects. And most often these would be manufactured in China, but during certain historical periods in Hong Kong as well. And they were marketed to uh, various parts of the world as uh, the advertisement on the left suggests. Um, and the import-export business of Sindhis in Hong Kong speaks to the community's global connections, as well as Hong Kong's position as a node in these uh, commercial networks. So in uh, interlocutors' narratives, um, when they describe the history of the Sindhi community here, they would often reference particular sites and spaces like Wan Chai, which is where the docks were for alighting soldiers, or uh, Wyndham Street, which is where early import-export firms had established, uh, Chunking Mansions, which is where many mail order and then electronics and small businesses were set up and where many Sindhis also lived. And uh, neighborhood, neighboring uh, mixed-use complexes in the Chimsachoi area in Kowloon, describing these as Sindhi or Indian parts of the city. And these became, in their memories, the Sindhi places of Hong Kong. And they used changes in these places to kind of map and chart the changing nature of the Sindhi community in Hong Kong. So for instance, many interlocutors compared Windham Street to a kind of Indian Chinatown. Raja told me that when I first came to Hong Kong in the 60s, I saw that Windham Street had all old firms and their names were all Sindhi. Chela Ram, Chotirmal, Vatanmal, Bhulchand. And I thought, wow, this is a Sindhi para or neighborhood. Uh, many tailoring and mail order firms were established in the Chimsachui area. And uh, 
interlocutors also recalled having monthly tabs at canteens set up by Chinese women who would serve Indian food primarily catering to this large population of young unmarried Sindhi men. So while um, sort of engaging with the East-West binary that's often used to frame Hong Kong as a place between China and the West, uh, these kinds of local histories and histories of locales reveal how place is made through a very wide range of uh, movements and mobilities and uh, people's memories. Um, alongside uh, these particular sites, there were broader place-based categories like Hong Kong side and Kowloon side. So belonging either to Hong Kong Island or to Kowloon, which was across the harbor, and uh, which was where Chimsa Chari and many of the smaller mail order shops were. Uh, became a way of loosely mapping Sindhi's migratory biographies, as it was understood that those who lived on Chimsachui may have migrated a bit later. Along with signaling these uh, migratory biographies, uh, these categories also began to take on uh, sort of implications of class and status. As someone told me that to be based on Kowloon side meant that someone had come in later and was not from one of the older Sindhwaki families or else had moved away from Hong Kong side due to financial exigencies. So Hong Kong therefore emerged as a meaningful node in the dispersed Sindhi merchant network through layered spatial and temporal resonances um, and its financial prosperity position as a transnational node and its role in facilitating global connections made it a place of desire and aspiration. But the history is a kind of in-betweenness that the Sindhi community experienced here. So um, as British immigration policies were progressively amended um, between 45 and 89, Sindhis began to experience a sense of insecurity in the context of the kind of racially determined changes in British immigration laws and also the impending transfer of sovereignty uh, of Hong Kong from uh, Britain to China in 1997. So the lead up to the 97 transfer of sovereign power in Hong Kong led to a concern with the question of who a local Hong Kong belonger was and who had a right to abode in Hong Kong. So the, the new Nationality Act proposed to replace um, the category of citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies, CUKC, which had afforded uh, Indian state mobility across the Commonwealth um, with three separate categories of citizenship. And uh, Sindhis were placed in one of these buckets, which would severely uh, restrict their global mobility and additionally would not guarantee their right to abode in Hong Kong. So they argued that they were sort of in between the changes in these uh, migratory policies because by uh, getting uh, the type of passport that the British government was proposing, they wouldn't have a right to abode anywhere on the basis of their passport. So a lobby group of young Sindhis called the Indian Resource Group, which was founded earlier to address issues of uh, racial discrimination in Hong Kong, uh, very successfully lobbied the British government in London for British passports for Indians in Hong Kong. And lobbyists had to kind of tread the line between professing loyalty to Hong Kong and to Britain and emphasizing their minority status, as well as the rights they had enjoyed as British citizens and their generational investment in Hong Kong to assuage the British government that they did not empire to, in fact, desire to um, migrate to Britain with these passports, but desired British passports to assure their right to a board in Hong Kong and also their ease of doing business with a strong passport. Um, so these tensions surface in what uh, Karan from the Indian Resources Group shared with me, um, an excerpt from which is on the screen. Um, another Hong Kong Sindhi community leader, K. Sital, was quoted in a newspaper article in 96 as saying, oh, there's nothing to worry about, we're a business community and we're not a political group, so any government will welcome us. However, despite his optimism, this moment also generated discussion about the community's relationship with and claims to belonging in India, specifically in Bombay, where they had a long history of commercial and cultural ties. But in a South China Morning Post interview in 95, Bal Thakre expressed a distinct lack of wel welcome for Hong Kong Sindhis and also accused them of pushing up property prices in Bombay. So in this exchange, we see that while Sindhis' historical ties to Bombay are acknowledged, Thakre refuses to accord Hong Kong Sindhis uh, the status of belongers or the right to refuge here. And added to this was the response of other Hong Kong residents who framed um, Hong Kong Indians and Sindhi's advocacy for British passports as special treatment. So this moment reveals the in-between nature of this community's diasporic status. 
and uh, a, a kind of politics of uh, insecure belonging, as uh, suggested by Almogawa, who argues that long-term residents of a place, uh, non-citizens, may respond to citizenship precarity by articulating uh, new forms and categories of belonging beyond citizen and non-citizen. Just as in Hong Kong, Sindhis advocated for new and different ways of categorizing them. Um, so here we see the diasporic group position themselves at nodes through national and local categories in a transnational political arena. And at moments such as these, their stretched and sometimes conflicting affiliations and disaffiliations surface gaps in legislative categories. And they engaged with these gaps to articulate new categories uh, for their belonging. Uh, so two, two categories as such that uh, I found used uh, to discuss Hong Kong Sindhis over uh, a range of sort of uh, historical moments was overseas Indian and Sindhi. And uh, there's always sort of a, a strange tension in trying to discuss a diasporic group like Hindu Sindhis because the minute you start unpacking terms like Hindu or Sindhi, there's a great deal of sort of instability and complication that emerges when you try to pin uh, these sort of terms to place and to a group. And uh, attempts to describe or explain Hindu Sindhi in terms of culture, religion, or identity points towards a range of multiplicities and instabilities. Um, or through ethnographic encounters and interviews, I found uh, shifting and contingent ethnic affiliations and discontinuities and dis suggest the configurations of ethnicity rather than ethnic ties preceding or being the basis of diasporic affiliations. So I'll highlight two categories which emerged that kind of demonstrate this. Um, also on the screen is one of the pages from the Indian Overseas Directory of Hong Kong, which was published in 65. Um, it's addressed to new residents and visitors to Hong Kong, but the directory very clearly contains a snapshot of the Sindhi, the Sindhwaki Merchant diaspora, um, because uh, through the firms it lists and uh, as evidence through the surnames uh, listed under as proprietors. So the term Sindhi, however, is nowhere deployed in this directory. And similarly, two of the leading uh, Sindhi diaspora magazines, which were published from Hong Kong, um, in the 60s onwards, position themselves through their names as Indian publications, the Bharat Ratna and the Indian, even though they cater primarily to the Sindhi business diaspora. So this identification as overseas Indian contains an ambivalence because it implies a relatively more permanent residential status than a visitor or traveler, but also connotes a group that's always overseas or away from India. However, in the early 90s, a new organization and directory emerged in Hong Kong, the um, Sindhi Association of Hong Kong in China, and their directory lists on the Sindhi residents of Hong Kong. And Raja suggested that uh, the publication of this directory was in response to um, the proliferation of other sort of groups like uh, Marathi and Gujarati groups in Hong Kong, and a desire to consolidate a kind of Sindhi identity in Hong Kong. So uh, rather than sort of reflecting uh, the contemporary community social lives, their publications invoke a more originary framing of uh, sin through various cultural motifs. And the stories of community and category that are told by these publications and how they position themselves um, complicate the connections between business, diasporic community, and ethnic identification. So this is not to suggest that diasporans have moved to identifying primarily as Sindhi rather than Indian or overseas Indian, or that a reactive sense of troopism was responsible um, for this, but rather these directories provide sort of clues into how ethnic and group identifications are contextual and how they're connected to place and how they change over time. So they remind us how at diaspora nodes, um, these kinds of identifications emerge and shift due to localized as well as global configurations and context. Interlocutors also discussed their relationship with the category of ethnic minority, which is a part of sort of public uh, debate and state uh, policy as well in Hong Kong. And they expressed, expressed a somewhat complex relationship to this category. Um, many of them cited the long history of the Sindhi community here, their kind of generational investments. And uh, however, some also signaled uh, their difference from a Hong Konger identity. 
Um, so they would also narrate experiences of discrimination. Some uh, expressed how they preferred to send their children to international schools rather than local Hong Kong schools that they could afford it. And some uh, build social networks primarily amongst the Sindhi community here. So these articulations seem to challenge the idea of uh, newness versus Chinese indigeneity in Hong Kong, but they also set apart a Hong Kong Sindhi identity from a Hong Kong identity. Uh, so Anjali Bhavnani, uh, for instance, who ran um, an NGO which worked with ethnic minorities, um, saw the category of ethnic minority as deeply racially coded and as grating against her self-perception as a third generation Hong Konger. But another interlocutor, Mohit, um, described how um, he felt uh, racially discriminated against in certain moments in Hong Kong, uh, but also how he felt incredibly comfortable here and how he presented himself as a Hong Kong guy on a global stage, especially when he was doing business. Uh, so this kind of identification as a Hong Kong guy in India and on a global stage, as compared to a more racially marked Indian in Hong Kong, demonstrates how diaspora actors experience entanglements and conflictual identification in different moments and places in time. Uh, so these narratives also speak to how Sindhis experience Hong Kong as a Sindhi place. There are long histories of business, the close-knit nature of the community, and a degree of social and cultural capital commanded by Sindhis within the Indian diaspora in Hong Kong, uh, engender a sense of Sindhiness in Hong Kong. But uh, this can also be further unpacked by uh, discussing how Sindhis draw India into Hong Kong and their relationship with, uh, with India as a place. So this brings me to discussing sort of diaspora and the future. Uh, another aspect of thinking with diaspora nodes is taking into account a more expansive approach to diaspora temporalities. And uh, this entails an attunement to individual aspirations, migratory biographies, as well as historical turning points. So in discussing where to stay put and when to move, and in describing Hong Kong as a Sindhi place, uh, interlocutors articulated a range of futural orientations that frame their relationships with the city and potential migrations elsewhere. And so I suggest that it's, it's valuable to view diaspora nodes through the question of the future, rather than focusing primarily on past displacement as what sort of unites the group. Uh, so Raja, who was one of the many who rushed to migrate from India to Hong Kong in search of work in 69, because he heard news of a changing immigration policy, which would mandate a stamp on Indian passports that would limit their stay in Hong Kong. Uh, so he described his first impressions of Hong Kong as a lit up city in compared to India. And Anita now in her 60s and living in Hong Kong told me that when she was growing up in Delhi, I always saw it in movies and I used to see the lights. I heard that Hong Kong Sindhis were there and they were all rich people. I was from an average family, but, but I always had Hong Kong in mind because I had seen pictures and they all said Hong Kong was a beautiful place. So until 69, visa-free entry was permitted to uh, citizens of Commonwealth countries. But in the later 1960s, a wave of young Sindhi men as well as women and families of those who were already working in Hong Kong uh, rushed to migrate and beat this uh, changing immigration policy, which would mandate uh, a stamp or a visa. Um, and Hong Kong came to be perceived in the Sindhi diasporic imaginary as a place of success and wealth through the flow of goods, ideas, and business opportunities uh, through the city. And in the diasporic imaginary, it seemed to be lit up like a beacon, uh, inviting migration, uh, particularly at moments uh, like these in uh, 1969. So changing immigration regimes rather than foreclosing migratory possibilities, illuminated uh, migratory pathways and imaginations of a prosperous future here in Hong Kong. Uh, for many Sindhi women also, Hong Kong was presented as a desirable place to find a partner, uh, not so uh, remote as many of the other locations on the merchant network. And uh, many more women began to migrate to join merchant husbands here post-partition. This also changed the kind of futural character of Hong Kong. So from a diaspora node, which was populated by itinerant young men who came to work on short contracts, there was a shift as families began to envision and invest in futures here on a longer temporal scale. So this uh, futural vision of Hong Kong was punctuated by a series of temporal junctures or turning points. 
and my own research was conducted over 2019 and 2021. And I met my interlocutors at a time of change and reflection. And they seem to be experiencing various degrees of unsettlement, whether it was a, a typhoon or escalating pro-democracy protests, or the pandemic, the new national security law, deterioration in their trade. Um, and I found that they would frequently reference and compare their present uncertainties to other times from the past. So they would most often compare the 2019 protest time to the 1997 handover time, which were two important junctures in the political history of Hong Kong. Um, and many told me that although they thought they would have to leave in 97, um, Hong Kong had not really changed for them as much as they had feared. And they hoped that this present time of uncertainty would play out similarly. So through um, these kinds of family histories and life narratives, I found that a series of unexpected turning points shaped participants' lives across generations and their businesses and belonging and mobility in Hong Kong and beyond. And some of these junctures were also the main points that are used to frame the history of Hong Kong. Uh, these moments became disruptive experiences of time, where the futural potential of Hong Kong that these diaspora actors had imagined and invested in was destabilized or reframed. And some of them drew, drew on their past futural imaginaries and desires of Hong Kong and described how they had weathered um, other disruptive junctures through their belief in the potential of Hong Kong. So as one interlocutor, Sham, whose custom tailoring and mail order business had remained shuttered throughout the pandemic told me, oh, every time there's a crisis, business falls, but then it gets even bigger and better. So now even with this pandemic, I think in the next two years, we're going to shoot very high because we are confident that Hong Kong is a magnet and there's nothing better than Hong Kong. So these kinds of engagements with temporal junctures and using um, past uncertainties as reference for negotiating and imagining a future in Hong Kong suggests that these kind of futures past, which may have materialized, failed, or expired, don't become closed chapters, but extend into the present and orient diaspora actors towards the future that is yet to come. Um, others, however, experienced pandemic time and protest time as very immobilizing and their past investments into a future in Hong Kong, such as the businesses they had built here or, or the, on the promise of sort of flows of goods and money to Hong Kong, had now also some described India as a future elsewhere rather than as a site of nostalgic longing. So they actively invested in businesses, cultural ties and retirement plans in India. And uh, some sought to draw aspects of India into Hong Kong by bringing Indian designers, Bollywood superstars and entertainers, um, saints and religious figures, and uh, nostalgic connections from their childhood and past into the city. So India then, through the lens of uh, sort of a diasporic elsewhere, is imagined as much as a site of the present and uh, as a place of futural potential, as a sort of a place of nostalgia and as a homeland. So um, considering the kind of interconnections of diaspora nodes across temporalities and uh, thinking about Hong Kong and India as nodes enables a more nuanced approach to the nature of diaspora ties and mobility. So take, for instance, this excerpt from an article titled A Sindhi Hong Kong on Indian Soil. So in it, the author of this piece, Mohit Bhavnani, who is a retired Sindhi businessman, makes an extended case for establishing quite literally what he calls a Sindhi Hong Kong somewhere inside the territory of India. He mourns the loss of the land of Sindh for the displaced Hindus after partition. But rather than simply petitioning the Indian government for a Sindhi state within India, Mohit wants to develop a Sindhi Hong Kong in India. So he suggests that Hong Kong was only made on leased land and became a world-famous tourist heaven. Sindhis should form a tax-exempt, non-profit, large organization in India and start making up a city like Hong Kong. How much longer can the Sindhi community continue melting? So although Mohit is concerned with the kind of melting of community without a Sindhi place, the place for them that he envisions is not reminiscent or evocative of Sindh, which was their home before 1947, but rather it's a Sindhi Hong Kong on Indian soil. So for Mohit, Hong Kong is a kind of futural elsewhere, 
that he uses to frame diasporic desire and a particular imaginary rather than a homeland orientation to the past. So he draws on these potentialities that emerged in Hong Kong to imagine a diasporic cultural place within India where generative encounters of trade and tourism and a continued possibility for mobility and enterprise are what will make the community feel at home as perhaps they have been in Hong Kong. So narratives like these demonstrate how um, much as diaspora actors are attuned to multiple spaces and places, this is also true for temporalities. And uh, through the lens of nodal mobilities, we can see that diaspora actors draw on a variety of temporal frames to negotiate their mobility and settlement at different moments in time. So this uh, brings me to how I sort of envision this idea of nodal mobilities. And I propose that rather than starting with categories of identity, homeland, and past displacement, a range of uh, nodal mobilities and connections may be used to frame the contemporary Hindu Sindhi diaspora. And I began to think about nodes and connections from listening to uh, interlocutors' articulations of how and why Hong Kong was a Sindhi place for them, which led me to kind of think away somewhat from their relationship with Sindh as a place and instead engage more thoughtfully with a wider range of diasporic sites and nodes. And I also listened closely to their reflections and concerns about when and where to stay put and to move, um, which also took on an urgency during the context of the pandemic. And so this idea of nodal mobilities makes space for how a range of individual diaspora actors relate to nodes and negotiate sort of the questions of moving and staying put. Um, this approach highlights the interconnected and uh, interrupted and also changing nature of uh, individuals and communities movements and connections through space and time. So I take a situated view from Hong Kong as a diasporic node and sort of follow the sort of the ideas that coalesce through diaspora around particular places and how these um, facilitate various socialities and settlements. Um, Hong Kong's commercial and temporal affordances and the global connections it offered frame its place in the global Sindhi merchant network, but equally particular desires and potentials came to coalesce at Hong Kong through the migration of Sindhis uh, to and through it. So um, I see diaspora nodes as sites where flows of people, ideas, and things collect and coalesce. And uh, diaspora and diaspora ties mediate connections to and between these kinds of nodes. And these create uh, forms of belonging and unbelonging, which unsettle somewhat the centrality of homeland in thinking about diaspora. So if, as the historian Rachel uh, Liao has argued in a recent uh, piece, if we should attend to homes, not homelands, and to spaces of fruiting, not rooting, I see nodes as points of attachment and shared connectivity, and also as points of articulation for further movement and connection, much as how in a botanical sense, nodes begin with the potential for growth and extension in new directions. And this speaks to some of the critiques of diaspora, which are built on um, sort of more arborescent metaphors of rooting and rootlessness, or the idea of the scattered seed. Um, so rather than trying to sort of naturalize people's connections to place, um, this takes a more expansive and uh, uh, nodal approach to diaspora. Uh, so maybe I'll stop here. And uh, I thank you so much for being here and for bearing with me. I know I went a bit over time, but I'd be very grateful for any um, comments, questions, suggestions for how to build further on this work and, and these ideas. So thank you. Thanks, Mr. Really rich paper. Um, so we have about 25 minutes now for discussion. So please raise your virtual hand or put a question in the chat box. Um, so I think I just wanted to kind of kick us off with the questions uh, by by asking one question about the way you framed your idea of nodal mobilities. Um, so my question was. Um, at what level are you proposing this kind of rethinking of the diaspora? Uh, which communities, which diasporic communities does this work for? And which communities does it perhaps not work for? I mean, I was just thinking about, um, for instance, the um, groups such as, um, say, the Sri Lankan Tamils, 
Palestinians. Um, I mean, they're very different groups from the from the Sindhi diasporic community. Would um, moving away from thinking about um, homelands and roots and displace, displacement and so on uh, work in the same way for these other groups as it would for the Sindhi community? Uh, so that was my question. Okay, thank you. I think that that's a really helpful uh, question. Uh, I think some of the work on um, specifically on uh, sort of uh, Palestinian and Sri Lankan Tamil communities has highlighted um, sort of transit places, spaces on the journey, um, spaces where certain kinds of connections and ideas sort of thicken and coalesce. So I think the framework of nodal mobilities shouldn't replace the, the sort of idea of homeland entirely, but it also makes space for um, how a range of places um, sort of have these uh, collections of ideas, imaginaries, people. Um, and in the present context, you know, where is it uh, that, uh, where and how do these uh, migratory and diasporic groups sort of uh, find and create meaning and a sense of belonging? So it sort of opens up uh, the sort of spatial and temporal uh, contours of how we think about migration and diaspora without discounting that sense of displacement, but um, creating room for uh, you know the places of the present and the places of the future where they where they settle, where they imagine futures, where they find homes. So I think uh, that's sort sort of what I was trying to work with when I was thinking about this idea of diasporic nodes, sort of expanding how we conceptualize diaspora, uh, not necessarily moving entirely away from the centrality of the homeland, but not using the homeland as the sort of core analytic for thinking about how a community holds together and how it moves. Huh. Thanks. Uh, Vishnu? Right. Thank you, uh, Radhika. Thank you very much. I'm no expert on diaspora, but I... Uh, you know, when Sindh was created as a separate province, if you remember in British India in 1936, uh, in the in the colonial, in the in the nationalist narratives of the time, 1936, 1936 is also the year when Orissa was also created as a separate province out of Bihar and Orissa. And they the argument at that point in time was that Sindh was actually given as a concession. This was this was the reading which was put out by the nationalists, that it was given to the Muslims and Orissa was given to the Hindus. Although the British argument at that time was they're actually creating two separate provinces on the basis of language. Yeah. Language and identity, but largely language-driven identity. How does the question of language and religion, the religious identity and the language as a kind of cementing force across the, the religious divide among sins play out in diaspora. There is something you mentioned about that in Hong Kong, uh, the, that people want to create uh, the Hindu, I think a couple of times you said Hindu, Sindhis and so on. But how does the element of language, which is often seen as a kind of binding force more than religion uh, in a particular region, how does that work out in the in the, in, the, in the various spaces that Sindhis find themselves over, over centuries now. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, I think language, uh, I'll speak first to the contemporary context of Hong Kong and then sort of move to the kind of historical colonial context. So in the present context, there is a lot of anxiety about uh, sort of the loss of language and the loss of the Sindhi language that's articulated by cultural leaders and sort of uh, prominent figures. Uh, so there's uh, this sense that the younger generations don't speak Sindhi and they've become too globalized and they've become too cosmopolitan and they've lost touch with their roots. Um, so this discourse is uh, kind of in the last decade, I would say, has really um, sort of picked up steam. Um, there's some um, efforts to kind of uh, sort of start language classes, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a big part of the conversation that community leaders and sort of cultural leaders want to have about Sindhis and Sindhi identity. So it is, it is important in that sense. Um, in terms of the sort of historical colonial context, uh, there's 
there's a really interesting uh, special issue on Sindh's region, uh, which is in, uh, I think, the Journal of Philology. I think I'm not sure. But uh, sort of historians, Sindhi of Sindh from Pakistan and India have come together to sort of explore how uh, Sindh emerged as a place in uh, colonial discursive popular imaginaries. And in that, uh, some of what I've drawn from that is that uh, the colonial imaginary sort of uh, sought to create a divide between Hindus and between uh, Muslims who they presented as more indigenous to Sindh and uh, they presented Hindus as outsiders, they highlighted their sort of uh, businesses, they uh, sort of uh, included Hindus in the wider logics of uh, sort of who a Hindu was that were emerging across the rest of the subcontinent, even though Hindus in Sindh, their practices, their cultural lives were, uh, did not align very closely to the ways in which Hinduism emerged in other places. Uh, for example, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of Sindhi, uh, Sindhi Hindus uh, were Nanak Panthis. Many of them, uh, yes, they followed Vaishnavite practices, but many were also Sufi. So there was a lot of sort of, uh, diversity in terms of everyday lives and religious practices in sin, but the colonial government sought to kind of create a category of uh, Sindhi Hindus and mark them as discrete from uh, Sindhis who were Muslims. And so this kind of category of Sindhi Hindu emerged through these uh, discourses and in these ways. Um, which uh, historians have documented. And this idea of Hindus being uh, sort of other and different in Sindh um, sort of a quite... So Sindhi nationalists sort of uh, sort of create a very regional kind of Sindhi identity. But then um, Hindus at that time were sort of torn between this uh, identifying with this kind of regional Sindhi identity and a kind of linguistic... Uh, cohesion and uh, wanting to negotiate for belonging in India at the time. Uh, so there were all of these sort of spaces where they found themselves in between competing categories and discourses that were mapped along uh, religion and along language. Um, there was a major debate in colonial Sindh about, for example, about the script. Uh, what script should be used to codify Sindhi. And the colonial government uh, proposed using a different script for uh, Hindus in Hindu schools and a uh, different script for Muslims, which uh, met with a lot of resistance because the people felt that it would exclude Sindhi Hindus from uh, uh, certain sort of uh, uh, opportunities. So like that, there were many of these junctures where uh, this group sort of became a group and uh, was constructed as a group by these sort of uh, colonial discourses and these kinds of categorizations. Uh, so in terms of language, I, I would say broadly that it's, it's a complex issue. Also because Sindhis very often highlight that they were not given a state and land in India, even though uh, they emphasize that India was organized according to linguistically. Um, so that is also a, a big point of contention that they articulate sort of a loss of land. But I mean, what, what I find is that this is a conversation that sort of cultural leaders are having, whereas the conversation that every day sort of my interlocutors were having was quite different. So they were not invested in these debates about land and language in the same way. Um, they were more interested in... Uh, a history of cosmopolitanism. They were more invested in sort of histories of migrations that they felt that they had lost touch with but would like to know more about. Um, they were concerned about sort of what will the next generations do because these older modes of Sindhi business are dying. And does that changing forms of business, does that dilute a sense of community? So there were a lot of different kinds of conversation happening around Sindhi identity that I think that I was interested in including sort of all of those conversations as well. I'm not focusing primarily on uh, these broader sort of political conversations about uh, uh, language and, and territory and bringing sort of these everyday articulations of belonging and identity into that kind of debate as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karthik, you have a question? Thank you, Radhika. That's a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to like expand this idea of the node or uh, nodal influence to other communities, especially migrant 
and also merchant communities that have spread across India, especially from the Western state uh, into other states of India and also to other foreign nation, uh, other foreign countries. Could we use the same analytical tool that you're proposing to look at them, especially about the migrants within India, in other Indian states, for example, the Marwadi communities uh, within other Indian states? Can we think of them like that? And also, I'm curious, what would the sins of Malaysia or Singapore think? So I'm... I'm also aware that there's a small pocket of Sindh population, but a considerable pocket of Sindh population. Even in the Malaysian Peninsula. Could you I think I lost you. I think I lost you. You were asking what 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 about the perspective of Sindhis in Malaysia and Singapore, right? Yes. Do, do they share similar perspectives on uh, let's say the nodal influence of coming back and establishing a Sindh state or a Sindh land in India. Do they have such similar ideas of Hong Kong or Sindh? There is a Singaporean Sindh that does it exist, that idea. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. That that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, so I think what I uh, what appeals to me about this idea of looking at a range of diasporic nodes is to account for how, you know, articulations of being Sindhi will be different in Hong Kong and in Malaysia and in Singapore. So for some, there's this imaginary of Hong Kong as a futural place and Sindhis in Malaysia and Singapore may not hold the same view of Hong Kong and different configurations of belonging and identity would emerge in Hong Kong and Malaysia. So for example, in Hong Kong, Sindhis for a long time were the majority within the Indian community there. Whereas that's not the case for Singapore. And this certainly shaped, you know, how um, they experience and uh, the city and their belonging there. So in Hong Kong, Sindhis had a sort of a great deal of sort of social capital and they shaped, uh, for instance, the contours of uh, Hinduism in Hong Kong. So they sort of take on responsibility of presenting a kind of Indian identity there as well. Um, so people who I spoke to would say that, you know, uh, like younger people would say that uh, I just took for granted in Hong Kong that I was surrounded by so many Sindhis. And then when I went to Canada, uh, though I didn't know any Sindhis and I just thought being Indian was being Sindhi. And when I went somewhere else, I experienced being Indian and being Sindhi very differently. So uh, I think it's important to account for, you know, these kinds of diversities and differences in place, um, which I hope this idea of the diasporic node uh, offers us a chance to do. Um, uh, in terms of like uh, the idea of a Sindhi Hong Kong, I think that article was definitely um, sort of uh, not representative of the how the entire community feels. I think it's a very sort of isolated demand that he's putting forward. But there is a lot of conversation about, you know, Sindhi land and the Sindhi territory within India. Um, and this I found an interesting sort of way of putting it, which was uh, sort of not building on this idea of uh, Sindh being sort of taken away from Sindhis and then a desire to have it back, but imagining a different kind of future place, which is built on an imaginary that emerges at a diasporic node at various historical moments. So I think um, I found that interesting. And when it comes to like extending this idea of the diaspora node, I, I mean, I hope that it can be expanded to a range of sort of contexts and maybe not even to cities, maybe at a different scale. So maybe, you know, thinking about particular localities as nodal. Um, really creating an imaginary that isn't uh, isn't so tied to a singularity of like a singular and linear temporal and spatial movement, but looking at branching rather than uh, this kind of linearity. So, I mean, I hope that it has resonances for various kinds of migrations and mobilities as well. Yes, that's true. I also think that there could be a possibility of uh thinking of branching rather than a single way of migration. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jane, can I ask an another question? Yes, please. Uh, unless somebody else uh, have some question, I don't want to. We have, we have one question from 
Biswaji. Biswaji, do you why want to uh, why, why, don't you, why don't you take that question first? But I've already okay. asked a question. Yes. No, you could go ahead, actually. I typed because yeah. uh, the network was yeah. on and off. Okay. So you spoke about women joining the Sindhi merchants in Hong Kong and assuming those were Sindhi women, have Sindhis opened up to enter marrying and how does it change the character of the community? Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I would like to flag that Mohit's voice is certainly not representative of the community. Um, and he, when I interviewed him, he really lamented that uh, people weren't taking him seriously, but that this was the best way. Um, and I think another interesting example that I'd like to cite is um, the example of Gandhi Dham and Adipur in Gujarat, which were also uh, built by a Sindhi businessman called uh, Bhai Pratap and uh, after partition, and they were imagined as a kind of a Sindh in India. Um, but they failed to develop, uh, and a lot of refugees did settle there, but they didn't develop into the kind of commercial havens that perhaps Bhai Pratap may have imagined. And so that is another example of a kind of futural place because he, in his vision, he wanted that to be a free port and he wanted it to be um, a space where Sindhis could continue to trade and rebuild their businesses. So like that, I think it's interesting to consider different kinds of visions of Sindhi places in the future. Um, because, you know, this idea of Gandhi Dham is very often considered as a failed future in vision, but it still very much exists as a place and people live there and, and there's an institute of synthology there, which is uh, doing really like excellent work in sort of collecting uh, resources and historical material. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how what we may consider to be these closed chapters or like to be in the past, how they extend uh, into the future as and into the present and how these kind of futural visions are quite diverse of diaspora actors and sort of look at these kinds of imaginaries of the future. So my intention, I think, wasn't to say that Mohit uh, is representative of the community. But yes, I think he there's a tension between holding on to a kind of purity and a desire for a consolidated Sindhi identity and uh, an acknowledgement of how the community has grown and developed. Um, so, so you are right in that there is some notion of the community melting and dissolving an identity and something being lost. But I found it interesting that, that his idea for consolidation wasn't like a sort of sealed off pure Sindhi place, but a place like a tourist haven. So I think that's what I found interesting about that example. Um, I think, I, I don't, uh, I can't authoritatively say has Sindhis opened up to intermarrying now, but I certainly found more narratives of Sindhi marrying outside the community. But um, I, I mean, as some of us might know that there's a practice of Sindhi women changing their first names after marriage, um, as well as their last names. Um, so I found that in younger generations, you know, that practice was still there, but uh, they had found a lot of them found ways of like creatively navigating that. So, if, for example, they would use their uh, prior name in brackets or in Facebook, they would add that as a nickname. So, they would find ways of keeping their original first name around as well, which women from the older generation wouldn't do. So, there are some changes in sort of across generations in terms of sort of women's experiences of marriage and migration. Um, a lot of the women I interviewed also uh, ran smaller businesses in Hong Kong. Sometimes they sort of leveraged the capital or the office spaces of the family business to set up their own um, sort of uh, smaller businesses as well. So, um, I mean, uh, a lot of my work actually dealt with uh, women's experiences in Hong Kong. So, I can go on about that. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Vishnu, you want to ask? Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, we have come to the end of it. I think just the community's relationship with uh, faith. You know, you spoke about Brahma Kumaris. You know, you know that there's a huge Brahma Kumaris the establishment in India currently, and it's headquartered in in Mount Abu in Rajasthan. But, but there's also a connection, there's a huge uh, uh, tradition of the Sufis in, in yes. Sindh. 
Yeah. I was wondering if there's any connection between this diasporic identity with uh, the Sufis. And the, finally, Sadhu Baswani. You know, we find that in Sadhu Baswani, in fact, some of the cities in Pune and others, some marked localities are actually uh, uh, as named after Sadhu Baswani's. This thing where actually largely yeah, Sindhi come in. Yeah. And, and so uh, yeah. just wondering what the kind of connection uh, between this identity and faith, you know, are, are the, what how that plays out. Sure. So there's a lot of, like, I would say the, the, Sindh, uh, the complex layers of Sindhi's relationship with faith and with Hinduism. There's a very rich literature. There's many, there's a French scholar, Michel Bovan, who is uh, focused on the, uh, Sin, uh, the Sufis of Sindh. Um, then there's, a, I think there's, not, there's a debate about syncretism when it comes to the Sindhi community. So some people argue that Sindhi religious practice, like Rita Kothari suggests that Sindhi religious practices were very syncretic before partition. And there was a gradual sort of hardening of um, identity, uh, starting with partition and extending to the present, where uh, Sindhi sort of aligned more with these kinds of dominant ideas of Hinduism. Um, whereas some people read, uh, say that that is perhaps uh, maybe an oversimplification, but I think from, um, from Hong Kong, what I observed is that perhaps because Sindhis were very influential and were a majority within the community, they kind of took on um, this uh, responsibility of uh, presenting a kind of Hindu and Indian identity in Hong Kong. So for example, they facilitated the um, migration, the import of a lot of these religious groups that you mentioned. They funded their centers and they brought over a, a wide variety of sort of religious uh, leaders from India to give talks and set up uh, spaces and centers in Hong Kong. There's a Sadhu Asani center there as well. Um, so in Hong Kong, uh, I think over time and because of their position and the kind of capital and influence they exerted there, they have taken on kind of shaping the contours of Hinduism in Hong Kong. Um, but one interesting thing that, that I found and that I discuss as well is this idea of seva. So um, because they want to position themselves as sort of these spiritual, civic Hindu citizens in Hong Kong, a lot of these centers do a lot of charitable work and seva in Hong Kong itself. So this idea of seva is certainly not um, exclusive to Hinduism. It's found across sort of many of the uh, religious traditions, uh, whether Nanak Panthi or whether Sufistic or, or Islam or wherever. But uh, the, the seva that they carry out is done through these kinds of organizations. So the Satya Sai Baba, the Sadhu Vaswani, the Brahma Kumaris, they organize forms of uh, volunteerism and charitable giving and a lot of Sindhi women are involved in these forms of seva. Um, and in Hong Kong, I would say there's a big presence of these kinds of groups. And uh, many of the Sindhi women are very closely involved uh, with the management and uh, practices and activities of these groups. So uh, this is, I mean, I don't have a good sense of the extent of this, but many women became vegetarian. So they will be the vegetarian ones in the household, whereas the rest of the family would not necessarily be vegetarian um, because they were followers of these uh, groups. This happened later. Um, so that way, there is a, a considerable sort of diversity of these practices. The uh, Brahma Kumaris is, I found a really fascinating story because it actually had its origins in sin. And now we don't know much about that history. But the fact that its early membership was made up of these left behind uh, Sindhwaki women. Um, and it, it was kind of like a safe haven for them away from their marital families. Um, but... Uh, that that history I found quite fascinating because uh, there was so much resistance to it and there's still like considerable stigma um, that attaches to being the early Brahma Kumaris that many of my interlocutors narrated to me because of these ideas of uh, sort of celibacy and uh, many of course later controversies around the sect that emerged as well. Uh, so yeah, I think faith has a, a, a big part to play in, in people's lives. Um, and uh, although perhaps this thesis of the hardening of Sindhi religious practices post-partition 
may may be a, a an oversimplification I, i wouldn't say that i would say that in hong kong yes they have taken on a lot of practices from sort of uh, and the, the management of these groups that that did emerge later and do um, sort of feed into this wider more unified sense of a hindu and national identity so thank I, you I would thank you that. thank you very much yeah. so much sarika um so i think we'll call it a day there um thank you for having thank me thank you so much for your uh, paper and for dealing with the questions in such a nuanced manner um just before we finish the session i just like to point out that we have another seminar in a couple of weeks time from today so on the 23rd of august uh, we'll have dr murmai satam who is assistant professor for history at bits law school mumbai who will be speaking to us about contesting the toilet colonial discourses elite protests and religious sentiments on public sanitation infrastructure in bombay city 1900 to 1945 So thanks again Radhika and uh, we'll end the session here. Thank you. Thank you.